In this next session, we are looking at a number of alternative costing systems. Now, the costing systems we look at in this section are more modern costing systems to our more traditional absorption costing or job costing systems. Now, fortunately, for F2 purposes, we don't actually have to do any calculations in this area. You just need to understand the theory of what's involved in each of these costing systems. So while I will use some easy numbers to illustrate um, how we apply each costing system, for exam purposes, you just need to know the theory. So the first costing system we are looking at is activity-based costing. Now remember back to absorption costing, if we wanted to calculate the overhead cost per unit, we would work out the overhead absorption rate as our budgeted overheads divided by our budgeted activity, usually our budgeted labour hours. And we would work out that perhaps our overhead absorption rate is two pounds per labour hour. And if we spend four hours producing one unit of a particular product, then we would charge them two pounds in overhead for each of those four hours. Now, this absorption costing system is something that works quite well in perhaps more traditional manufacturing environments. In older manufacturing environments, they were quite labour intensive. So, a lot of the resource used in producing our units related to labour hour labor hours worked. In addition to that, traditionally, the overhead cost incurred by a manufacturing company would be a reasonably low percentage of its total cost. So in a traditional or an old-fashioned organisation, and the direct labour and the direct material costs would be much higher than the overhead costs. So it didn't really matter if we were just estimating the overhead cost based on labour hours, if our overhead estimation was a little bit inaccurate, it didn't really impact the costing of our product because the overhead costs were low anyway. Now, in a more modern manufacturing environment, it's unlikely that our direct labour cost is the highest cost incurred in producing any unit. In modern manufacturing environments, and we've got far less labour input to the production of any product. It's primarily going to be machinery that's used to produce our products. Now, there's two impacts of that modern manufacturing environment. The first is that the number of direct labour hours incurred in producing a unit of our product will be a much, much lower proportion of the total cost per unit. In addition to that, the overhead costs of running a modern factory are far higher than they would have been in the past. So if we are using advanced technology and machinery to produce our product, then the largest chunk of our costs is going to relate to things like our machinery. So the initial cost of our machinery, our machinery depreciation, the cost of servicing our machinery if it breaks down. So our overhead costs in a modern manufacturing environment will be much higher. And it's not necessarily an accurate representation of our overhead costs to just allocate them arbitrarily based on labour hours. Now, activity-based costing and um, takes a more modern view. So in activity-based costing, we separate out all of our overhead costs into different cost pools. So this is just differentiating the different type of overhead costs we incur. So machine maintenance would be one overhead cost type, materials handling, another overhead cost type, and so on. So, we differentiate out our different overhead cost types and then we look 
at our cost drivers. Now, the cost drivers are just the activities which will increase each of our overhead cost pools. So, if we start noting down what we do in activity-based costing, we have our overhead cost items and we separate them out into our cost pools. Then we establish what the cost per unit is by looking at cost drivers. As an illustration, suppose one of our overhead costs or our cost pool is materials handling. By materials handling, I mean the cost of whenever our production department and requires further materials, they will order that from our stores department or our warehouse. And there's a cost associated then with transferring the materials required from our stores department over to our production department. So we'll say our budgeted materials handling cost is 100,000. Once we know what the overhead cost is and we have allocated it into our cost pool, materials handling, then we need to understand the cost driver. Well, for materials handling, I would imagine that the cost driver is the quantity of material used. The more material our production department needs in the course of a particular period, the greater the cost of handling or moving that material. So, we could calculate then our cost per unit. Suppose for a particular period our budgeted material usage in total is equal to 1,000 kilograms then we could say the cost per kilogram of material handled is just our overhead cost divided by the number of cost drivers. So 10 pounds per kilogram. And we would charge our overhead cost to each of our products on this basis. So if a product uses one kilogram of material per unit, the overhead cost for materials handling for that product is 10 pounds. If another product uses three kilograms of material, then the cost per unit for the second product will be 30 pounds. So 10 pounds for each kilogram handled. And we would do the same thing for all of our other overhead costs. Now, by taking this approach, we are looking at each of our overhead costs individually and thinking about what drives these costs, what makes them higher. And we're charging, then, those costs to our product, our cost units, based on their use of that particular cost driver. And that's our activity-based costing. Our second cost method is target costing. Now, target costing is all about how we approach calculating, really, the selling price for our unit. So, traditionally, if we were calculating the selling price for a particular product, we would start by looking at the cost per unit. Say it's £10. Then we would establish what markup do we want to apply? Say we decide we want a markup of 30% as our profit. We'd add that on to calculate the selling price of £13. Now, this is a sensible approach in one way. We are making sure that we cover our costs. However, it doesn't take into consideration our market, so our customers. 
What if our competitors are charging £12 for the same product? If that is the case, then we are unlikely to be able to sell our product at £13 each. So when we apply a markup like this, we're only considering internal factors. So how much does it cost us to produce the unit? Now target costing takes a different approach. When we apply target costing, we begin with the selling price we believe we will be able to achieve per unit. So if we're applying target costing, we'll start with the selling price. Perhaps we have a target price of £8 per unit. So we believe £8 is the price we will be able to achieve um, from our customers. Now we want to earn some kind of profit on each unit we sell, so the next thing we'd look at is what do we want our profit margin to be? Suppose we want our profit margin to be 20% of the selling price. Then we are saying we want our profit margin to be 20% of £8, so 1.6. So we want to sell our units for £8. We want £1.6 to be the profit earned by the company. So our target cost per unit then is £6.40. So if we want to achieve our target profit margin and our target selling price, we are going to have to produce each unit at £6.40 per unit. That's our target cost. Now when we've established this, we need to compare our target cost to the actual cost per unit. So how much is it costing us at the moment to produce each unit of our product? We'll say that the actual cost per unit at the moment is £10. Then what we have is a cost gap. So the cost gap is just the difference between our target cost per unit and our actual cost per unit. In this case, £3.60. And we need to close the gap. So, this company will have to take steps to ensure that our actual cost per unit goes down to £6.40. So, perhaps by looking at reducing our overhead costs, perhaps using a different type of material in the production of our units, once that won't affect product quality, and so on. By taking this target costing approach, we are considering our market, so we are taking into account how much customers are prepared to pay. In addition to that, we are focusing aggressively on cost reduction, and surely that is good for the company. Finally then, we need to look at life cycle costing. When we are applying life cycle costing, we are looking at the life cycle cost per unit, which will be the total life cycle costs divided by expected life cycle volumes. Now again, when we apply our traditional methods of calculating the cost per unit, what do we include? We look at the direct material costs, the direct labour costs, and calculate some sort of production overhead cost per unit. Now, however, this doesn't take into consideration the full costs of developing, producing and selling that product. When we calculate the traditional production cost per unit, that only tells us 
how much it costs to produce each single unit of our product now. In reality, it is likely that we will have spent quite a lot on our product even before we've begun producing it. So if you're a car manufacturer, you don't just suddenly start producing a new type of car one day. Before you get to that production point, you are going to have incurred quite a lot of costs in the research and the development of that new car. So you'll have looked at the specifications, the design for your new car. How will, you will have spent quite a lot developing a prototype of the new car and then testing it to ensure all the functionality works as expected. And then, once you're happy with the prototype, it's only then you're going to start producing and selling a large number of these new cars. So by applying life cycle costing, we are not just looking at the production cost per unit. We take into consideration all of those research and development costs we will incur before we even start producing our new product. So all we say here is, say if our research and development costs for a particular product are 100,000, our budgeted total sales per annum are 10,000, and our production costs per annum are 150,000. And we expect the life of the product to be two years. So with many products in a modern environment, the life cycle isn't particularly long. So if you think about it, when a new mobile phone comes onto the market, um, usually it will only sell for a reasonably short period of time, so perhaps six months or a year. And by the time one year has passed, some other new mobile phone with even better technology has come on the market, and our mobile phone has become last year's news, and we can no longer sell that particular model. So, with life cycle costing, we take into consideration then how long we are going to be able to sell our product for. All we do then is calculate the total life costs of this product. So, the life cost per unit will be our initial research and development costs, 100,000 plus our production costs for each of the two years we're producing our units, so plus two by 150,000. And then we divide it by the total number of units we're going to sell. So we're going to sell 10,000 units for two years. So we get two by 10,000 as our expected volumes. So when we work that through, you should get a life cost per unit of £20. The important thing here is that when we calculate our cost per unit, we are taking into account all of those initial research and development costs. So if we add a markup to calculate our selling price, not only are we covering the production costs, but we are covering all of the other costs associated with this particular product.